Lesson 5 Jesus as the Master Teacher Sabbath Afternoon October 24 From the days of eternity, the Lord Jesus Christ was one with the Father. He was the image of God, the image of His greatness and majesty, the outshining of His glory. It was to manifest this glory that He came to our world. To the sin-darkened earth He came to reveal the light of God's love, to be God with us. Therefore it was prophesied of Him, His name shall be called Emmanuel. By coming to dwell with us, Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. He was the Word of God, God's thought made audible. In His prayer for His disciples, He says, I have declared unto them thy name, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. But not alone for his earth-born children was this revelation given. Our little world is the lesson book of the universe. God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme into which angels desire to look, and it will be their study throughout endless ages. The Desire of Ages, page 19. In all that he did, Christ was cooperating with his Father. Ever he had been careful to make it evident that he did not work independently. It was by faith and prayer that he wrought his miracles. Christ desired all to know his relationship with his Father. Father, he said, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. Here the disciples and the people were to be given the most convincing evidence in regard to the relationship existing between Christ and God. They were to be shown that Christ's claim was not a deception. The Desire of Ages, page 536. The work of God's dear Son in undertaking to link the created with the uncreated, the finite with the infinite, in His own divine person, is a subject that may well employ our thoughts for a lifetime. This work of Christ was to confirm the beings of other worlds in their innocency and loyalty as well as to save the lost and perishing of this world. He opened a way for the disobedient to return to their allegiance to God while by the same act he placed a safeguard around those who were already pure that they might not become polluted. Messages to Young People, pages 253 and 254. Taking humanity upon him, Christ came to be one with humanity and at the same time to reveal our Heavenly Father to sinful human beings. He who had been in the presence of the Father from the beginning, he who was the express image of the invisible God was alone able to reveal the character of the deity to mankind. Tender, compassionate, sympathetic, ever considerate of others, he represented the character of God and was constantly engaged in service for God and man. The Ministry of Healing, pages 422 and 423. Sunday, October 25. Revealing the Father To those who receive Him, Christ gives power to become the sons of God, that at last God may receive them as His to dwell with Him throughout eternity. If during this life they are loyal to God, they will at last see His face, and His name shall be in their foreheads. Revelation chapter 22 verse 4 And what is the happiness of heaven but to see God? What greater joy could come to the sinner saved by the grace of Christ than to look upon the face of God and know Him as Father? The scriptures clearly indicate the relation between God and Christ, and they bring to view as clearly the personality and individuality of each. The personality of the Father and the Son, also the unity that exists between them, are presented in the 17th chapter of John in the prayer of Christ for His disciples. The unity that exists between Christ and His disciples does not destroy the personality of either. They are one in purpose, in mind, in character, but not in person. It is thus that God and Christ are one. The Ministry of Healing, pages 421 and 422. 
Be, therefore, followers of God as dear children. Christians must be like Christ. They should have the same spirit, exert the same influence, and have the same moral excellence that he possessed. The idolatrous and corrupt in heart must repent and turn to God. Those who are proud and self-righteous must abase self and become penitent and meek and lowly in heart. The worldly-minded must have the tendrils of the heart removed from the rubbish of the world around which they are clinging and entwined about God. They must become spiritually minded. The dishonest and untruthful must become just and true. The ambitious and covetous must be hid in Jesus and seek His glory, not their own. They must despise their own holiness and lay up their treasure above. The prayerless must feel the need of both secret and family prayer and must make their supplications to God with great earnestness. As the worshipers of the true and living God, we should bear fruit corresponding to the light and privileges we enjoy. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, pages 249 and 250. Darkness covers the earth and gross darkness the people, and how ardently we should desire the presence of the divine instructor to lead us in the way of truth and righteousness. God has already spoken to man at sundry times and in diverse places and in various ways, yet the world's ignorance is increasing. We must speak with more pronounced utterances concerning the truth that we may bring to man a knowledge of God. The distinction between Christians and worldlings must be more marked. The Bible must become a book of more prominence among us, and the attentive, diligent searcher by painstaking effort must search for the hidden treasure. The maxims of men, the dogmas of error, though advanced by those who profess to be interpreters of the Word of God, must be discarded, for they are calculated to cover up the truth. That I may know him. Page 343. Monday, October 26. Revealing the Father, Continued. In Christ's parable teaching the same principle is seen as in his own mission to the world, that we might become acquainted with his divine character and life, Christ took our nature and dwelt among us. Divinity was revealed in humanity, the invisible glory in the visible human form. Men could learn of the unknown through the known. Heavenly things were revealed through the earthly. God was made manifest in the likeness of men. So it was in Christ's teaching. The unknown was illustrated by the known, divine truths by earthly things with which the people were most familiar. Christ's Object Lessons, page 17 Had Christ come in his divine form, humanity could not have endured the sight. The contrast would have been too painful, the glory too overwhelming. Humanity could not have endured the presence of one of the pure, bright angels from glory, Therefore Christ took not on him the nature of angels, he came in the likeness of men. Looking upon him, we behold the invisible God, who clothed his divinity with humanity in order that through humanity he might shed forth a subdued and softened glory so that our eyes might be enabled to rest upon him and our souls not be extinguished by his undimmed splendor. We behold God through Christ, our Creator and Redeemer. It is our privilege to contemplate Jesus by faith and see him standing between humanity and the eternal throne. He is our advocate, presenting our prayers and offerings as spiritual sacrifices to God. Jesus is the great sinless propitiation, and through his merit, God and man may hold converse together. That I may know him, page 25. Too often we grieve the heart of Jesus by our unbelief. Our faith is short-sighted, and we allow trials to bring out our inherited and cultivated tendencies to wrong. When brought into straight circumstances, we dishonor God by murmuring and complaining. Instead of this, we should show that we have learned in the school of Christ by helping those that are worse off than ourselves, those who are seeking for light but are unable to find it. Such have a special claim upon our sympathy, but instead of trying to uplift them, we pass by on the other side, intent on our own interests or trials. 
If we do not show decided unbelief, we manifest a murmuring, complaining spirit. O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Christ has already proved himself to be our ever-present Savior. He knows all about our circumstances, and in the hour of trial, can we not pray that God will give us His Holy Spirit to bring to our minds His many manifestations of power in our behalf? Can we not believe that He is as willing to help us as on former occasions? His past dealings with His servants are not to fade from our minds, but the remembrance of them is ever to strengthen and uphold us. Reflecting Christ Page 354 Tuesday, October 27 Reading the Master Teacher's Mind Too often when wrongs are committed again and again and the wrongdoer confesses his fault, the injured one becomes weary and thinks he has forgiven quite enough. But the Savior has plainly told us how to deal with the erring. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. Luke chapter 17, verse 3. If your brethren err, you are to forgive them. When they come to you with confession, you should not say, I do not think they are humble enough. I do not think that they feel their confession. What right have you to judge them as if you could read the heart? The word of God says, If he repent, forgive him. And if he trespasses against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. And not only seven times, but seventy times seven, just as often as God forgives you. Christ's Object Lessons, page 249. Jesus now explained to his disciples that his own life of self-abnegation was an example of what theirs should be. Calling about him, with the disciples, the people who had been lingering near, he said, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The cross was associated with the power of Rome. It was the instrument of the most cruel and humiliating form of death. But Jesus bade his followers take up the cross and bear it after him. No more complete self-surrender could the Savior's words have pictured. But all this he had accepted for them. Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. He left the heavenly courts for a life of reproach and insult and a death of shame. He who was rich in heaven's priceless treasure became poor that through his poverty we might be rich. We are to follow in the path he trod. The Desire of Ages, pages 416 and 417. It was for the joy that was set before him that he might bring many sons unto glory that he endured the cross and despised the shame. And inconceivably great as was the sorrow and the shame, yet greater is the joy and the glory. He looks upon the redeemed, renewed in his own image, every heart bearing the perfect impress of the divine, every face reflecting the likeness of their king. He beholds in them the result of the travail of his soul, and he is satisfied. Then, in a voice that reaches the assembled multitudes of the righteous and the wicked, he declares, Behold the purchase of my blood. For these I suffered. For these I died, that they might dwell in my presence throughout eternal ages. And the song of praise ascends from the white-robed ones about the throne. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation chapter 5 verse 12. The Great Controversy, page 671. Wednesday. October 28. The Master Teacher and Reconciliation Christ suffered in order that through faith in Him our sins might be pardoned. He became man's substitute and surety, Himself taking the punishment, though all undeserving, that we who deserved it might be free and return to our allegiance to God through the merits of a crucified and risen Savior. He is our only hope of salvation. Through His sacrifice, we who are now on probation are prisoners of hope. 
we are to reveal to the universe, to the world fallen and to worlds unfallen, that there is forgiveness with God, that through the love of God we may be reconciled to God. Man repents, becomes contrite in heart, believes in Christ as his atoning sacrifice, and realizes that God is reconciled to him. We should cherish gratitude of heart all the days of our life because the Lord has put on record these words. For thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. The reconciliation of God to man and man to God is sure when certain conditions are met. The Lord says, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Though he is the restorer of fallen humanity, yet he telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord, and of great power, his understanding is infinite. The Lord lifteth up the meek, he casteth the wicked down to the ground. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving, sing praise upon the harp unto our God. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem, praise thy God, O Zion. Fundamentals of Christian Education, pages 370 and 371. He who commanded the light to shine out of darkness sheds light into the mind of everyone who will properly behold him, loving him supremely, showing unswerving faith and trust in him. His light shines into the chambers of the mind and into the soul temple. The heart is filled with the light of the knowledge of the glory that shines in the face of Jesus Christ. And with this light comes spiritual discernment. The closer the acquaintance a man has with Jesus Christ, the more careful he will be to treat his fellow men respectfully, courteously, righteously. He has learned of Christ, and he follows his example in word and action. By faith he is united with Christ. We are laborers together with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9 This Day with God, page 135 Thursday, October 29 The Master Teacher's First Pupils Suddenly the heavens are lighted up with a brightness which alarms the shepherds. They know not the reason of this grand display. They do not at first discern the myriads of angels that are congregated in the heavens. The brightness and glory from the heavenly host illuminate and glorify the entire plain. While the shepherds are terrified at the glory of God, the leading angel of the throng quiets their fears by revealing himself to them, saying, Fear not. As their fears are dispelled, joy takes the place of astonishment and terror. They could not at first bear the radiance of glory which attended the whole heavenly host to break upon them suddenly. One angel only appears to the gaze of the watching shepherds to dissipate their fears and make known their mission. As the light of the angel encircles them, the glory rests upon them, and they are strengthened to endure the greater light and glory attending the myriads of heavenly angels. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1115. It was not alone upon the hills of Judea, not among the lowly shepherds only, that angels found the watchers for Messiah's coming. In the land of the heathen also were those that looked for him. They were wise men, rich and noble, the philosophers of the East. Students of nature, the Magi had seen God in his handiwork. From the Hebrew scriptures, they had learned of the star to arise out of Jacob, and with eager desire they awaited his coming, who should be not only the consolation of Israel, but a light to lighten the Gentiles, and for salvation unto the ends of the earth. Luke chapter 2, verses 25 and 32 and Acts chapter 13, verse 47. They were seekers for light, and light from the throne of God illuminated the path for their feet. While the priests and rabbis of Jerusalem, the appointed guardians and expounders of the truth, were shrouded in darkness, the heaven-sent star guided these Gentile strangers to the birthplace of the newborn king. 
The Great Controversy, page 315. The Messiah's coming had been first announced in Judea. In the temple at Jerusalem, the birth of the forerunner had been foretold to Zacharias as he ministered before the altar. On the hills of Bethlehem, the angels had proclaimed the birth of Jesus. To Jerusalem, the Magi had come in search of him. In the temple, Simeon and Anna had testified to his divinity. If the leaders in Israel had received Christ, he would have honored them as his messengers to carry the gospel to the world. To them first was given the opportunity to become heralds of the kingdom and grace of God. The Desire of Ages, pages 231 and 232. For further reading, The Faith I Live By, A Personal God, page 40, and Steps to Christ, Repentance, page 24.